All right, so our first prophetic warning in this hour is we have to watch over our heart towards God. The second one was it's really important that we watch over our hearts towards one another, that when we're passionate about something, not to judge others for being passionate about what they're passionate about, but to stay in our lane, run with our tribe, and cheer everybody else on. The third prophetic warning I've had, and I've had this all year, but I think it's important that we revisit it because right now in the midst of all that's going on is God gave me this warning Gosh, end of last year, I think it was. It's been a little while. But one of the things he told me was to help the body right now learn to process loss without seeing it as defeat. And the reason this is so important is when you're in now, I, I know for some of us charismatics, you're going to wrestle with me, but let me unpack this for you. Because you know me, I believe we have the victory in Christ. We were from the victory in Christ. We're not contending for victory. We are contending from victory. We're executing and legislating the complete, utter, and total victory of the finished work of the cross and the complete and utter victory of the empty tomb. In the midst of that, in this realm, as we steward and legislate and execute and war from that victory, there will be loss. Many of us lost friends to to COVID and COVID treatments in the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. There can be opportunities that seem to have been lost in any moment, doors that didn't seem to open, maybe relationships that fell away because of some of the other warnings we've talked about. It'd be foolish to ignore the loss because then you're just locking it away, locking it away, locking it away. You're actually in denial. You're not in kingdom. But we must understand that loss is not defeat. And I'll give you the example that God gave me look to the cross for the disciples there was actually loss at the cross mm -hmm. they had lost their rabbi they lost the their mentor they lost their understanding they lost how they thought things were going to go they lost their understanding of wait wait i i, I thought legion of angels were going to come and you were going to bring forth a what do you mean? You really, I mean, I know you told us, but you did get arrested. You did get found guilty. You did get tortured. You did get hung on the cross. And now you're dead. There was loss. They lost things, but none of it was defeat. It was the exact opposite of defeat. It was the greatest, most total, utter, complete victory ever. And they had to learn to process that loss without seeing it as a defeat. That's what Jesus does with Peter in John 20 when he calls Peter to the shore. Peter was really wrestling with loss and seeing it as defeat. So he's actually back where he was before he ever met Jesus in John 20. Mm -hmm. He so sees this as defeat, not loss, that he's back to fishing. And he can't even catch fish anymore. He's so messed up. And Jesus leads him through the process we all know about. But basically what he's saying is, no, focus on my love. Everything we've talked about. Focus, watch over your heart towards me, watch over your heart towards others, learn to process the loss, but don't see it as defeat. Last mm -hmm. thing I'll say is he really does a brilliant job of doing this with Mary in the tomb because Mary doesn't even recognize him in the tomb. She thinks he's the gardener. And then when he says her name, Mary, her eyes open and she realizes it's Jesus. But what does she say to him? Depending on the translation, it's either teacher or Rabboni, which means teacher. What is she relating to him as? She's relating to him as she has known him, as opposed to seeing him as the victorious risen Lord. And he says, woman, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to the right hand of the Father yet. And many have interpreted that as, don't cling to me, because if you do, I can't beam up. That's absolutely not it. He's saying, don't so cling to what you've known of me, that you can't meet me and have me for who I am now. If you only cling to me, if you can't process the loss of me as teacher in your life every single day, you'll never have me as victorious risen Lord. But she gets it. She understands. She says, I've seen the Lord. And then he launches her out into the next season of her life, which is a prophetic and preaching ministry. When he says, go and tell the brothers what you have seen. He's saying, yes, there has been a shift. There has been a change, and that often looks like loss. And you must process that because if your goal is only to get back to what you've known, you'll never come into all he has for you in this new season. Or you'll see loss as defeat and think it's all over and give up, which is what the devil wants. We have to learn to process loss without seeing it as defeat. You guys know we went through a big battle last year. You guys helped pray us through it. My wife was threatened with a very serious and very scary and very fatal attack of cancer. 
and praise God through, uh, through prayer, through our miracle working God, through our God who uses doctors. She's come through it. She's cancer free. I was having lunch with a buddy or actually coffee with a buddy. And he said to me, Hey, I so appreciated the message you preached once, once you had gotten the, the, the diagnosis that she was now cancer free. But let me ask you something. What would that message have been if she had, if she hadn't, if she wasn't cancer free, if she'd gone home to glory. And I looked at him, I said, God is my witness. It would have been the exact same message wow. because God would have answered my prayers and my wife would be cancer free in heaven right now. I'm not here to question God. I'm not here to figure God out. I'm here to give him glory because he healed my wife. He healed my wife through prayer. He healed my wife through doctors. He healed my wife because he's a miracle working, healing God. He also heals people by bringing them home to glory. And I said, that's the difference between loss and defeat. If that had happened, I would have lost my wife in my life every single day. My brother-in-law would have lost his sister. My nieces and nephew would have lost their beloved aunt. And I would have helped them process that loss. But the way I would have helped them process it is to not see it as defeat but to give glory and honor to God, who we don't often understand, but is always honoring his word and performing his promises. So wow. the third prophetic warning right now is to not deny or ignore loss, but to learn to process it without seeing it as defeat. Because if we take it as defeat, we think our God's promises aren't true, he can't or he won't, or we simply lay down and give up. Wow, wow, so good. Well, I, I'll jump in here. I, I love what you're saying, Robert, because there's a few things I think that we need to recapture in our generation. Ryan was sharing about that earlier, about recapturing the truth of the kingdom in many ways. But I think one of the things that we need to recapture in our generation is the sovereignty of God and realizing that God is sovereign no matter what happens and that the only way the truth is, the only way we can be defeated is apart from Christ. When we are in Christ, we cannot be defeated. Sickness can't defeat us. Sin cannot defeat us. Time cannot defeat us. Space cannot defeat us. Loss of relationship cannot defeat us. Changing of seasons cannot defeat us. Nothing can defeat us when we're in Christ. The Bible even says sin no longer has dominion over us. Death, hell, and the grave no longer have dominion over us. And I think one of the, the main things that people struggle when it comes to this topic is sickness and death. Those are kind of the main things people think of when they think of loss. Now, loss is multifaceted. Loss is many different things. Loss can be relationships. Loss could be job. Loss could be title, position, whatever, you know, people watching can associate to their lives. But a lot of times what people associate to loss is death and or sickness. And I love what you said. I was actually really moved by what you just mm -hmm. said, Robert. I've never heard you say that before because I know the personal battle you went through with your wife and her illness and that person saying, what would have the message been if, if she had gone home to glory? And you're saying it would have been the same thing. That statement itself encapsulates basically everything we need to say in this entire section that you are not defeated. Loss does not define you. Sickness does not define you. And healing is our portion. Like for, for me, my wife struggles with diabetes. You'd never know it to look at her. She mm -hmm. looks very, very healthy. Uh, she doesn't have some of the main things that people normally struggle with them when they struggle with diabetes. And I've laid hands on her. Now, I, I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen all kinds of healings that the Lord has done. And But yet when I lay my hands on my wife and the, the person dearest to me or my children, she doesn't get healed. So how do you reconcile that? That feels like loss. It feels like defeat. It feels like failure, but it's not. It's not because in the timing of God, in the sovereignty of God, God will either heal her on this side or he will heal her in the eternal realm when she or me or whatever our time is upon this earth, when our days are completed. The, the Bible says that God knows our times and our times yes are in his hand. And it's very, very hard sometimes to reconcile that God's times are not our times because he doesn't do things the way that we want him to do it. He doesn't do it in the timing that we want him to do it. Maybe we lost a loved one. Maybe, you know, we've suffered or maybe we've seen somebody suffered. And so the healing didn't come in our time. The victory didn't come in our time, but it came in the timing of God. And in those seasons, we have to press into the sovereignty of God. 
Now, we don't want to say that God is sovereign and then just throw healing out the window like some denominations do. They say, well, God is sovereign, and if you're going to get healed, you'll get healed. We don't need to lay hands on. We don't need to evangelize. Some denominations believe we don't even need to evangelize because God is sovereign. You know, it's it's part of the overemphasis of of Calvinism. But So mm -hmm. we don't want to go that direction. But at the same time, when we feel like we have these unreconcilable things in us of loss and grief and sickness and death and all of this, we have to lean into the reality. Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I will accept your sovereignty when things are beyond my control, because in that there is peace. And when we strive in that place, there's torment and torment is not of the Father. It's not sent forth from the Father. It's not originated from the Father. And many times we torment ourselves in the place of why, 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 why. And we question God and we question his sovereignty. When we can find peace, and as Ryan was sharing earlier, comfort in the sovereignty of God. I hope that makes sense. I, but yeah, I just, it does. It's something we've got to recapture is that God is sovereign. And even in our loss or in even death or in sickness or suffering, God is sovereign and it is not defeat. It is not failure. It might be loss in this realm, which is like a spit in the ocean compared to eternity. And it's not loss. It's, it's not, it, it might be loss. It might be suffering, but it's not defeat because the reality is the truth is we cannot be defeated if we are in Christ. So mm -hmm. just to, to contribute that to what you so powerfully already communicated, Robert. Yeah, you know, Benjamin, one of the things the Lord showed me in times of questioning all this stuff and learning uh, to rest in the mystery, because not I, I, I'm not saying I'm perfect at this or a pro in any way, but it's always where I come back to when I realize why, when I'm wound up, it's, I'm not resting in the mystery. But right. two things he showed me that really have helped me over the years, so I submit this to all of our wonderful viewers, is... Number one, we always say, God, do exceedingly abundantly beyond my ability to ask, think, or comprehend. And one day he kind of let me know. He said, you realize you're asking me to be confused, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, I am. If I'm asking you to do exceedingly abundantly beyond my ability to comprehend, I'm basically saying, God, I don't want to understand. I want you to do beyond my understanding. And I'm glad God's ways are higher than my ways, just like you said. So that's when I started to learn to rest in the mystery. And it doesn't mean I stay there, but I can return there. The other thing that really helped me, and I'm not saying I like it any better, but it helped me, was God really showed me one day that part of my challenge was I was so focused on me that I didn't understand that some of the greatest battles where I was seeing temporary manifestations of what looked like loss but weren't defeat is I was actually contending for others who weren't able to battle in those things. Like even my 12 year health battle where it looked like there was so much loss along the way, loss of strength, loss of tons of weight, loss of the ability to try. There was loss along the way, but not only was there not defeat, the Lord showed me that every time I declared that he is the Lord who heals that went, what word went forth and somebody who didn't have the strength or faith to fight I was fighting on their behalf. So it wasn't a 12 year battle because Satan was winning for 12 years. It was because God had blessed me with a battle bigger than I expected because there was fruit that I never imagined. And there was victory on behalf of us. And then he let me know, you realize, of course, that there are others battling for you in areas you're not as strong and you won't know till you get home to heaven. So those two things don't make that any more fun, but it really helped me understand, God, you're always there. You always care. You're always up to something. And truly, your ways are higher than my ways. I'm going to rest in that mystery. And then when I really struggle, I always look to the cross and not only remember that I'm loved and that he cares, but that never is there defeat, even when there seems to be loss. But it's actually always a setup for great victory. And the cross testifies of that. Ryan, let me bring you in. Man, you guys are hammering some strong foundations there. Very, very good stuff. You know, it, again, I have to ask myself a question. Why would I view a loss as defeat? Um, it, it, when, Robert, you began to share your past year and, and with your wife and all that and everything that had happened, I, I, some time ago I began to really, I got focused on the fact that the way that mankind views success, I've never known. 
Mm-hmm. I've never known success the way that man says success is supposed to be. And and I would say I've known failure a whole lot more than I have success. Mm-hmm. But I never stopped getting up. I kept getting up. I kept getting up. I kept going. We we've, you know, I don't have enough time to tell all the things of of the losses that we've been through and we've endured. But I got to this point when I said, if I've not been successful in the eyes of man, why do I keep getting back up? And why do mm-hmm. I not view it as defeat? And I, I'm, I'm really big. I don't listen to a lot of um, mainstream worship. I, I'm, I'm kind of um, recluse in that way. I love to listen to other worship that most people don't even know is a part of. And one of those comes to a group out of Ireland, and I love what they put out. And this guy had put a song out and it says, when I found Jesus. And when I heard it the first time, I mean, I was a basket case, just a puddle of tears. And it wrecked me because it it was something so significantly different in my life that I know that Jesus found me. I'm not discredited in that. But there's something prolific about the understanding of when you actually find him and when you actually discover him. And wow. Wow. <clears throat> so wow. as you guys were talking, um, it, that's kind of coming back up in my mind. And, and why wouldn't I view these things as a loss? I mean, these losses as a defeat. What is it? Where, where, where am I connecting the dots? Where, where, where am I missing it or this or that? And two words come to my mind. Uh, one is agenda and assignment to know the difference between the agenda and the assignment. So Mm. why would I not view a loss as defeat? Well, I have to know the difference between what is an agenda and what is an assignment. And I just quickly look this up by definition, according to Cambridge dictionary uh, assignment, I mean, agenda is a list of aims or a possible future achievement a list of matters to be discussed in a meeting or a secret aim or reason for doing something. So basically an agenda is a reason to be doing something versus an assignment is a piece of work given to someone typically as a part of their studies or their job, a job where someone is sent to do it. And all of a sudden, as I'm reading over those dictionaries in our English understanding, I'm getting this download that the father assigns us. Wow. The enemy mm. has an agenda against wow. us. Wow. And if he has an agenda, I will experience loss because the agenda of darkness is to steal, kill, and destroy. Right. But the assignment of the kingdom is that I might have life. Come on. And not only have life, but have Ooh. an abundant life. Mm-hmm. And an assignment Ooh. outweighs an agenda. Mm-hmm. An agenda is a temporary task, wow. but an assignment is my life. Wow. The reason that I have to, wow. the reason that I have to keep getting up is not simply because I'm a husband and I'm a father. The mm-hmm. reason I have to keep getting up is because the assignment of my life is to equip and advance the kingdom of God. And so I've experienced the losses because of the agenda of darkness. I've experienced those, and they've knocked me off of my feet. And I haven't gotten to experience. Sorry, I'm getting so emotional. This is awesome, Ryan. Powerful. The reason I haven't got to have man's success is because the assignment has already marked me successful in the kingdom. My success, if I go through the the agenda of mankind and what that looks like, I I might have temporary success. I might have the big home and the nice cars and the nice clothes and all those things. And I'm not discrediting it for those that have those. I'm not discrediting it because that's a part of your assignment. Your assignment looks different than mine. But my assignment, the reason that a loss cannot be defined as defeat is because my assignment already was marked victorious before I ever said yes to him. But if I walk in the agenda, then every time I'm knocked down, I consider it to be defeat. But the assignment, this is where I go back to Jonah. 
God speaks to Jonah and says, I want you to go and I want you to, I want you to preach repentance to Nineveh. And Jonah didn't simply disregard or disobey uh, the word for Nineveh. He actually said to God, I didn't go to Nineveh because I viewed those people not to be worthy to repent, mm -hmm. which is going back to all these other words that you've been talking about, Robert. But here's the thing. Nineveh was God's assignment. Mm -hmm. In one way or another, even through a stubborn, hard-headed, self-righteous prophet who thought he knew better than God, God still allowed things to happen to him, but positioned him in a way that the assignment of Nineveh outweighed the agenda of disobedience. And that's where we're at right now. We have to understand that, yes, we're going to, I think of Paul, the Apostle Paul. I think if he was alive today, we would, there were so many people on social media, would, they would ridicule him. They'd call him, call him a false prophet, a false apostle. They would say, no, he's doing something wrong. Look at all these bad things that are happening to him. Look how many losses he has suffered Wow. at the hands, quote unquote, of God. He's not in the will of God because if he was in the will of God, these things wouldn't be happening to him. See, I think that's where we, we miss it. The, the, the loss, let's go to the shipwreck, the most famous one. The, the loss of the ship, the loss of the cargo, the loss of the men, everything that took place there was not the assignment. The assignment was that the king in Malta would know the healing power of God. And yeah. through a man of God who said, yes, Lord, who was a prisoner, who, by the way, when they got the new ship, they got the new cargo and got the increase of the money, he still said, I'm going to go back to be the prisoner because this is part of the assignment. He didn't allow the success to redefine who he was in the assignment. And I think that's, I'm getting preachy now, but <laughs> that's where we're at right now as the body of Christ. I want to see sons and daughters who in the midst of loss refuse to call it defeat because they understand the assignment of the kingdom outweighs the defeat of the agenda. So I get knocked down, you get knocked down, but we keep getting back up because there is a victory that is before us, but it's because the assignment was marked over our lives. Though he did, we didn't know him in that moment, and though we didn't love him in that moment, he knew us before we were ever formed in our mother's womb, and he loved us when we despised him, ridiculed him, mocked him, and made every excuse known to man. But the truth is, he said, your no, that mm. defeat doesn't stop the assignment of the kingdom. Yes. Wow. So Ryan, got, that that was more, that was that was amazing. Thank you. You you so captured what I was trying to say. And, you know, one of the things the Lord had shown me this year specifically is the agenda of hell, to use your words and the way you broke down from John 10, 10, the agenda of hell versus the assignment of heaven and our assignment here in the earth through the assignment of heaven. God showed me this year one of the agenda of hell was to take our faith, to get mm -hmm. us to lay down our faith, because mm -hmm. hell understands the substance of our faith better than most Christians do. Because as, as our viewers have heard me share this so many times and teaching this so many times, but quick review, if you haven't, is faith is not just believing. Hebrews, it is believing. Faith is choosing to believe the eternal truth of God. Absolutely. Choosing to believe that Jesus is Messiah. Absolutely. It is belief. But there's another aspect to it that we don't hear enough about. Hebrews 11, 1 talks about our faith is a substance. And what that means is one of the main ways we operate as dominion stewards in the earth is when we choose to believe eternal truth over temporary circumstances. When we did choose to believe that there is no defeat, even in the midst of loss, because we have the victory then the substance of our faith works to establish that eternal kingdom reality here in this temporal realm that we're to steward with God, for God, on behalf of his God, 
all to his glory, on behalf of our God, all to his glory. And the enemy was targeting faith like never before. The agenda of heaven was apostasy in 2022 to point to all the losses, all the challenges, all the difficulties, and get you to see them as defeat. So you not only would turn away from God, but you turn in that you'd turn away from your faith because as Ryan just unpacks so powerfully, Every time you choose to continue to go forward and get back up, something is being accomplished through the substance of your faith beyond your ability to ask, think, or comprehend. But the enemy wants you to feel defeated, sidelined, ineffective, and, 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 and that. Sidelined, ineffective, defeated. And God is here to remind you with this warning, you are having so much more impact than you realize by simply choosing to believe, choosing to get up, choosing to move forward. Ryan has is, is his name is known in heaven and feared in hell. And it has nothing to do with the size of his media outreach, the size of his church or the size of his ministry. It has everything to do with he is a man who is he unpacks so powerfully understands assignment and understands that even in the midst of loss, he is having the exact opposite of defeat, but victory after victory after victory on behalf of heaven, which is why we're here. Amen. Wow. That was amazing. Thank you both so much for this. Thank you for helping me unpack and share these prophetic wor words, these prophetic warnings. Any last words to the viewers before we wrap up, guys? Well, since I'm on the bigger screen here, I'll go ahead and, and say this. Um, I, again, thank you so much, Robert, for allowing us to be a part of this. I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, I, I want to say the, the defining line for me is the fact that I found Jesus. He always knew where I was at, but I found him. And it's, there's something different. It's, it's, it's like that pursuit that you're pursuing. And when you find it, there's something special about that. And when I found him, everything changed. But I, I want to say this one thing, and I cannot take credit for this. Rodney Hogue said this in a conversation that we were having. And he said, in the body of Christ right now, the one thing I want to see more in the local church is less brothers and sisters and more mothers and fathers. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, you know, everybody's going to say that. I, everybody's going to say that, but I need you to, as Robert says, unpack that for me. And he said, pretty easy. Brothers and sisters will always compete against one another. Mm -hmm. Fathers and mothers will raise sons and daughters in order wow. to see them sent out into what they were created to be. Wow. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, he said that to me months ago, and it has changed my whole view mm -hmm. that I, I, you know, I, not that I'm discrediting ever being called a brother, but I see the importance, uh, even at a, you know, relatively young age, that it, it is to one day to make sure that I step into my identity as a spiritual father and raise sons and daughters in what they're created to be and not be satisfied in being a brother and sister because I just, I have absolutely no desire to compete with anyone. I want to run with those who recognizes, you know, Robert, you can do something better than I can. Benjamin, you can do something better than I can. So mm -hmm. why do I have to beat my head against the wall and do it? Why don't we work together and co-labor with one another instead of compete? And I got to say this and this and that. No, nah, that, that garbage is over. I mm -hmm. want to step in the fullness of being a spiritual father and a mother so that I can see people advance instead of the competition. I'm done with that. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> RyanJohnson.us, you guys, you're going to want to go to Ryan's uh, website and hear more from him. Also, on all your podcast platforms, look for the Blacksmith Chronicles, Ryan's podcast. He sends it out as an audio podcast. You can also get it as a video podcast. And, of course, he's got a YouTube channel with the video podcast and all sorts of other great messages, great revelation, great insight. And you can find all of it at Ryan Johnson. You see his name badge there underneath his picture, dot .us. So all one word, Ryan Johnson, dot .us. Don't miss that website. Ryan, thanks for everything that you shared. Benjamin, you. final words from you, my friend. Yeah, I mean, what a rich time we've had together. I, I so have felt the fellowship of the Holy Spirit between the three of us, even though we're not even the same room. We're online together, but I've so felt the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Just 
briefly, one, one thing to say is as Ryan was sharing, it was like, I felt a spirit of defeat being broken over the body of Christ. And so I just want those watching to receive that, receive the authority of the word that was just released through what Ryan said and receive the freedom, the deliverance. There was a deliverance anointing in what he was sharing and Robert in many things that you have shared as well. And I think many people who are watching have partnered with defeat, but today that partnership is broken. And the main way that you can stop partnering with defeat is to refuse to give up, refuse to give up. You know, none of us are perfect. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God and that many of us, you know, we miss the mark. The, the word sin is hamartia in the Greek. It literally means to miss the mark. If you're shooting at a bullseye, you go left, you go right, you go up, you go down, you miss the mark. So all of us miss the mark. But the thing that we need to remember as believers, brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, everything God has made us and everything we are moving into and being formed into is that when we refuse to quit, we move on with God. But when we partner with defeat, when we partner with that, we stop our forward motion. We stop our forward progress. And we actually partner with the enemy when we choose to quit, when we choose to believe his lies rather than believing who God says we are. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. He gets back up. The unrighteous fall, the righteous fall. But the one that is righteous gets back up and refuses to quit. R Leonard Ravenhill said this, I've seen I've seen many things in prayer, but one of the things he said in prayers, he said, the sinning man stops praying, but the praying man stops sinning. Mm -hmm. And so that, that man, that woman that's, that refuses to partner with their feet, refuses to give up, those are the ones that move on. Those are the ones that move into the full freedom that God has for them. So those that are watching, receive that delivering power that Ryan just released. And, and this is the day of freedom. This is your emancipation proclamation for you to stop partnering with defeat in every way that you've partnered with it. Stop partnering with failure by receiving the truth and the reality that you are not a failure. And in Christ, you cannot be a failure. It's not who you are. It's not who he says you are. That's the word of the enemy over your life. And we three, we break the power of the enemy. We break the power of those words. We break the power of every label that has ever been put on your life, that you're a failure yes. and you're defeated. It's a lie and its teeth are broken now and it looses you completely. Its hold looses you now completely in the name of Jesus and you move on into freedom as you refuse to quit and as you refuse to partner with defeat from this day forward. Yes. Amen. Benjamin, I know you've just, you're, you're, you've, you've, uh, you're launching a new website. You're launching a new uh, ministry. Tell everybody uh, about that and where they can get more from you as well. Because I know with the new website, I didn't know if there was a new address and I want to make sure you give it out correctly. Sure. Well, Robert, thank you for the honor to be on here with you and Ryan. I consider it an, an honor. Um, I love revival because in revival, you consider everybody else better than yourself. <laughs> I, I experienced that with a man named Peter Fabianic in Croatia mm. that we received a revival anointing together. People were shaking in the glory for weeks and weeks. And the main thing that both he and I picked up out of that was that I literally thought he was better than me. And he literally thought I was better than him. And so I feel that same spirit here today. Amen. Like you guys are better than me, my, my betters, my seniors, my elders. And so it's an honor. What an honor to be on here with you and to fellowship in the spirit the way we have today, to feast on the mm -hmm. word we have today from one another. And, uh, and so what an honor. It, you can connect with us on Facebook. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Benjamin dot ignite. B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N dot I-G-N-I-T-E. And if you want to connect to our website that my wife and I have launched, uh, I lead Ignite Ministries International with my wife, Tara. Another one I consider better than me, my better half, my, you know, much better looking half at the very least, you know, but uh, you can go to www.igniteministriesinternational.com. Again, that's Ignite, I-G-N-I-T-E, igniteministriesinternational.com. And, you can and hey, that. Benjamin, real quick, uh, let them know about the trip in February that we're doing in Israel. It's an incredible opportunity and uh, share about that and share the vision for that. I know they're going to want to hear about it and a lot are going to want to come and join. Oh man, what, what a pleasure and what an honor to be able to do that, Robert. Thank you. So we are going to Israel in February, my first time in three years. 
I've been to Israel over 20 times with Bishop Robert Stearns and helped to lead trips with Apostle Barbara Yoder. And so I've been there many times. But if you had told me in 2020 that I wouldn't be back for three years, I would have just said, no, that's impossible. I have an assignment like Ryan was just talking about. I have an assignment to Israel. But that's what happened. When we were there in 2020, we went in March of 2020. And it was the last trip I was uh, able to take three years ago, almost now. And basically during that time, everything was shutting down in the United States. My wife was texting me from home. Our, our baby, Sophia, was just an infant at the time. She was texting me, I can't find baby formula. There's no food on the shelves. There's no, it wasn't just toilet paper. It was baby formula. It was diapers. It was different things that there were shortages of. And so she's texting me that from home in Israel. They're shutting everything down. We're like one of the last groups that are able to access different sites and different things. They're threatening to take tour drivers and tour, tour guides and, and bus drivers licenses. If they guide tours through Israel, everything was shutting down. Hotels were shutting down. We actually, in the end of the tour, had to leave our hotel. And in all of that, it's it was like I saw this death shroud coming on the nation and on the nations of the, of the earth. And we went through COVID. And in that season, I said, God, what are you doing? And he said, I'm teaching you how to rejoice in the midst of everything that's happening. And so everywhere we went, we were spreading life. We were spreading joy. We were laughing. Our laughter was literally echoing through the empty streets of Jerusalem and Haifa and Tel Aviv and everywhere we were going. But as we approached this trip, we were praying, my wife and I, and we said, God, what do you want us to call this trip? And he said, call it, roll the stone away, roll the stone away. And basically what the Lord says was, in the Bible it says that as they approached the, the tomb, they looked up and they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And I believe as we present ourselves before the Lord in Israel, as we present ourselves before the Lord in Zion, as Psalms exhorts us, that literally there's going to be a lifting of our head. The Bible describes God as our glory and the lifter of our head. So we're going to lift up our heads and we're going to see the stone rolled away. And there's reproach that's going to be rolled away. There's a death shroud that's going to be rolled away. There's death, you know, assignments that are going to be rolled away over people's lives. There's miraculous power, resurrection life that is going to be released Amen. over in and through us as we present ourselves before the Lord in Israel. And so join my wife and I and our good and dear friend, Robert Hodgkin, who is helping us to lead this tour. Other pastors and leaders who are signing on from New Jersey, New York City, other places all around, uh, not the world, all around America right now. We hope other nations can join us and you're certainly welcome to join us, those that are watching. But we're going February 18 to 27, 2023 to roll away the stone and to experience resurrection power and life in the land and nation of Israel. Amen. Uh, and you gave them the website, right? Where they can find out more? I'm so bad at that. Thank you so much. So you can go, you can grab that by going to pursuittravel.org. Pursuit Travel, P U R S U I T T R A V E L, pursuittravel.org, and grab the information, everything that you need to get. Uh, fill out the application, put in your deposit. Uh, the time is uh, drawing short to be able to put in your deposit and actually pay for the trip. It all needs to be paid by the end of November. So the time is short. So make sure you take action now and uh, join us. We would love you to join us. Yeah, you know, something amazing always happens when you go to Israel. It's it's always profound, but especially when there's a prophetic promise over a trip like this, you're not going to want to miss it. Benjamin, Ryan, thank you so much. I so agree with you, um, uh, Benjamin. This was a really rich time. You guys, I want you to know how amazing these two are. I had basically just sent them a text and said, hey, I want to do I want to do a web stream with you guys about prophetic warnings. I've got a few I'm carrying. I know you'll bring something to it as well. And so none of this was really pre-planned or pre-rehearsed or notes or anything like that. This is just the wealth that these guys carry. And I want to really thank you both for all that you added to this, all that you brought to this. And to all of you who watched, a couple things. First of all, I want to remind you, you really are having so much more impact than you realize. Don't give up. Don't give in. If you have, you're forgiven. Get back up. Get back on track. That's why God has these, gives us these warnings as we talked about. But this is an epic and historic time. These are biblical days, and you have a huge part to play. So be encouraged, be equipped, be empowered, go forth and do great things on behalf of the kingdom, and recognize that you already are. The last thing I want to say to you all is I want to make sure you know you can hear even more 
from Benjamin, from Ryan, from myself, and from the amazing Sergio Scataglini, a, a powerful Argentinian revivalist, and an event we're doing October 14th and 15th. It's our Heroes Arise Southwest 2022 event, and this event is called Words of Fire, because God has promised us that through Sergio, through myself, through Ryan, through Benjamin, through Francisco Arboleda, through Dustin Williams and surprise guests that we have, he's going to speak with words of fire and he's going to be like a burning bush in our midst. This is a men's event. This is our Southwest men's event for the year. So men, you don't want to miss this because part of God's promise as he speaks with words of fire in the worship in the messages, in the ministry, in the fellowship time, is he is going to use that fire to free you, fuel you, and further you in all that you've been created for and all that you're called to. This is a time of acceleration. This is a time of things that have been dead or dormant being brought back to life and reactivated, and you want to be there to receive these words of fire. So join us October 14th and 15th right here in Maricopa, Arizona, you can go to menonthefrontlines.com and click the events link to find out more. Or if you have any questions, email me, robert at menonthefrontlines.com or robert at roberthotchkin.com. Thanks so much for being with us for this session of prophetic warnings. Go out there and do great things for the kingdom of God.